right now with multifamily, warehouse, retail, office, it's the same. It's anywhere between 20 and 40% equity versus 60 to 80% debt. Today, what we're talking about is we're talking about sources and use. And this right now has always been a requirement from the banks, but a lot of the banks would put this together in their own format with their own spreadsheets. And now the banks are requiring sources and use to be a part of lending where you figure it out as an investor and a developer. And so I want you guys to understand what sources and uses are so that that way when you go in and you're going in for lending, you don't sit back and go, what sources in use? And the reason I tell you this is because I hadn't done a sources in use in probably a decade. No one had asked me for it, no bank, no institution, no one had asked me for a sources in use in a long time. So I had to go back and remember what, how, how to put together a sources in use. And I went back to go look at some of the sources in use documents that I had built back when I was doing retail. And right now, because banking is a little bit more conservative in regards to lending on any asset, whether it's office, retail, multifamily, or anything. In fact, a lot of syndicators and stuff are, are actually feeling the compression in the market right now because of asset management fees, because of low returns, the internal rate of returns are really bad, uh, because of high interest rates and extended leverage. And so um, a lot of syndicators rely on increased rents so that there's increase in revenue, the increase in revenue gives you a larger net operating income, which we'll talk about today and how that's figured out. And it gives you a larger valuation on your asset, hence allowing you to sell for more or refinance for more, being able to have upside potential for your investors, which has been extremely compressed over the last two years. And now that compression is being felt down um, downstream. So the systems and uses are, the sources and uses are very important. And here's the reason why it, what the banks want to know is they want to know where you're sourcing your money from. Okay. So what sourcing is, is the source of your money. So for sake of example, okay, now sources and use can be done different ways. And so if you're doing a value add property, it's slightly different than doing new construction. So one of the things that I really want to explain to you guys today is the sources in use as it relates really to new construction. So that's the vast majority of everything that we do. Now, if you're doing like a single family home, typically they're not going to make you do a sources in use. Um, they just want to know what the um, loan to cost is to build and where you're sourcing the equity, which is your down payment. Typically it's between 20 and 40% right now, depending on the institution that you actually get, get lending from. And so uh, right now, with multifamily, warehouse, retail, office, it's the same. It's anywhere between 20 and 40% equity versus 60 to 80% debt, okay? So if you take 100%, if you take 100% of the money needed to build an asset, okay, you're gonna have someplace between 80% uh, loan to cost or you're gonna have uh, someplace about 70% loan to cost. So let's call it, uh, right in today's world, let's call it 70% loan. This is the debt, okay? That way you guys know what I'm talking about when I'm saying debt. You have 70% and then 30% of what you call equity, okay? This is your down payment. This is your equity, okay? So together that equals 100%. So look, they want to know where you're sourcing 100% of this. So you'll have like construction debt, okay? So you're, uh, so you're going in and you're saying, okay, I have construction debt. And then you have um, investor's equity. Let's say that you're doing investor's equity. Okay, then you're gonna have your GP equity. That's like your primaries. Like if I was my project, I'd be the GP. So if, if I'm put, coming in with capital out of my own pocket, I disclose that now. If I'm raising capital from folks just like you guys, I disclose that right now. And so one of the things they just wanna know where this money's coming from. They wanna know how you're getting it, where you're indebted to it. And that way they know what the bank knows what its liability is going into this head on. Okay, so you have your GP equity. And then you have your, uh, your NOI offset, okay? Now, 
what you you might have like some mezzanine debt or you might have like your your um, not net operating income so if you have rental income we've done this when we're repositioning like hotels for sake of example when we're doing like an old hotel or motel and we're taking it we're decollateralizing it a lot of times if there's multiple buildings like we did this with a la quinta inn and suites that we did years a few years back and what we landed up doing we landed up buying that asset but we would we just broke it down there were six buildings and we shut one building down at a time. And what we did is we went in sequential order. As one building was done, the tear out was done, then we'd go into the next building. But we would, then we would keep five buildings running in the beginning. Then we went four buildings running because we do one building we'd start tearing down. That building had to stay uh, unoccupied, obviously. Then as that building, the tear out and demo was done, then we go to the second building. And then with this building was building number one that we were actually... Uh, doing the construction on now we started doing the framing the plumbing rough ends we started adjusting electrical we started putting in fire sprinklers and all of that rough in stuff on the utilities from electrical mechanical plumbing sewer all of that stuff started getting taken care of in building one the demo got started in building two as building two got demoed and we moved to building three we still had three other buildings running because it was six buildings then we started demo on building three and we started the electrical plumbing mechanical rough ins and top outs on those ones and then on the building one all that stuff was done got inspections now we're doing the sheetrock on building number one okay now we still had revenue coming in from the other three buildings as we were doing this now by the time we do this and we sequentially go building number four building number five building number six by the time we get to building number six now we still have net operating income because building one should be nearing completion and starting lease up so the net operating income comes from the revenue that's being generated from the capital that that asset is still actually generating in spite of the construction that's happening uh, that's happening in that property so that's one thing i love about strategic repositioning of assets that are actually cash producing like hotels and motels we did that also with our youngtown project down in phoenix it was an old office building it was 30 percent leased so we had enough of it vacant that we were able to start demolition and construction on 70 percent of the rest of the property where we actually leveled out probably 20 percent of one of the of the square footage one of the buildings got decollateralized and we actually landed up leveling it taking out the swimming pool that was in there it was a big physical therapy and um and um rehabilitation center that was in one of the facilities and we moved them demoed that building Landed up moving a couple tenants, but we kept the revenue going. So we actually had revenue that was coming in. Banks like that because now they know that you have a little bit of cash flow and revenue coming in. So we kept that revenue going in until the entire demo was actually completed. And they were more of a hindrance in there than they were an asset to us. Because when the tenants become a liability because they're occupying space that you need to reposition, then they're a liability. Then it's time to exit them, kick them out and get them out of there. Now, it's not quite that simple, but we had already strategic plans of how we were repositioning people. We had brokers working to help some of these tenants reallocate, uh, relocate and, um, and put allocate them in a different area. But Point being for this, for this is that you might have some net operating income, some revenue to offset your expenses. So you're going to have some uh, net operating um, offset. Okay. Now, these, ladies and gentlemen, is the source of your, of your money. Now, let's take, for example, I got a project down in Phoenix. And right now, we're, uh, we're doing our sources and use for this in particular project. And it just ha so happens that it's about a $60 million project. And the construction budget on that's about $44 million. So when I, before I can figure this out, what I have to do is I have to figure my use because I need to know what I'm spending on and what those expenses are and what they tally up at. So when I go in and I tally up the, my, my, the use of my money, then I can reverse engineer it and, and say, okay, this is what I need. This is how I'm, this is where I'm going to get the money from. Okay. So source versus use. Okay. So the use of your money, you're going to have land cost. Okay. So you're going to have land cost. That's one. Second is you're going to have interest reserve. That's the money that you pay the bank that the bank wants to see in an account so that that way they're not bothering you every month for a payment. It's just interest reserve. You put that money in there for the interest. The bank draws on that money. 
and it's just the reserve capital to service the debt on that loan as you build. That way you're not bothered by it. They make you upfront that money in the beginning of the loan so that way you're not encumbrance by it while you're focusing on your build. It's already brought into the front end of your loan. So you're going to have some interest reserve, okay? And then you're going to have uh, placement fees. Now, these are fees, the, the placement fees are fees that are going to be associated with banking and lending and so forth and so on. Those are uh, fees in order to get money, financing. There's going to be fees and costs, which will be your uh, lending fees and costs on debt service to your to these guys, your equity guys, and even to your GP equity. Um, you may be paying back some of that if you invest with your investors under your syndication. So you're gonna have placement fees, okay? These are banking fees um, and interest fees, so forth and so on. So these are all uh, placement fees, okay? And then you're also gonna have a uh, construction budget, okay? Now this is the amount of money that you're gonna spend actually constructing the place. Okay, now let's reverse engineer this. I know a lot of questions that people are saying, okay, well, Jerome, where do I get these numbers from? That's not in today's class, right? Today, we're only going over sources and use. Just know that when we get this, is we actually go in and have our general contractors, if I'm GCing the project, I take a finished set of drawings or preliminarily set of drawings that are near completion. Like for example, this set of drawings right here is not fully complete, but it's complete. So this is my West Camelback project, but there's still some changes that are being made, but it's near completion enough to get pricing on what we're doing. Like we're not changing the structure, we're not changing the size of the structure, not changing the quantity of the, uh, of the units. All that stuff's been approved through the city already. Parking lot, parking spaces, all of that's been approved. What we are making modifications and changing to is some of the civil engineering, the grading and drainage, um, some of the small logistical stuff as far as how we're doing our breezeways, stairs. Now it's the detail items. But I'll tell you that 99% of what you need is right here in this set of plans by the time you get to this point in lending. And so you can't get lending without this, ladies and gentlemen, this is what you need for lending. So when you go in, you do a systems in use, you go in and I, I'm, I send that set of prints out to my construction contractors, my plumbers, my electricians, um, my heating and cooling guys, my foundation, my concrete guys, my roofers, my painters. Um, I send it out to my steel guys for my handrails. This is all for like our apartment stuff. You're doing residential, you're sending your stuff out to all of your residential contractors. Same trade, same, same everything, except for maybe you don't have fire sprinklers or maybe you don't have like handrails and guardrails and stuff like that, but you will have 80% of the exact same subcontractors as you would normally have in any commercial project. So the systems, the, the sources in use are gonna be almost identical because you start getting these bids back, okay, if you're the GC. If not, like what we did is we sent that set of plans out to our general contractor. The general contractor goes to bid with a project, meaning that they put it out to bid to all the different subcontractors. Then they collect numbers and they're trying to get three bids on everything and then they compile a spreadsheet of all the costs and that's where we get our budget numbers. Now, our budget numbers came in at about uh, $207 a square foot all in. Now this is like permits, this is um, all of our um, general contractors fees, this is all of our subcontractor fees, this is all materials, all labor, all of it, the whole shebang. $43 million, this one came in to be 43, 43 million, 590, we'll call it 591, 591, okay? So $43,591,000. Now, we're gonna have our land cost. Our land cost actually cost us $2.6 million, but because we had some of um, the, because we had some investor equity in there, we had to service some debt, and we also ran some of our entitlement fees in with that. So we're gonna include all of our entitlement fees, architecture, engineering, everything into what we have into land costs. So the land cost on that one is gonna be someplace in the neighborhood about $5 million is what we're gonna um, go in on our land cost, okay? Now, we're, we're in about 3.2 to 3.5, and so when we go in and we do our sources and use, if our numbers are skewed in our pro formas, the budgetary numbers that we utilize to, to check the cash flow that's coming in on those properties. So what we do is we go in and we check with other properties that are like the property we're building in the area. And we get property management companies along with big brokers like CB, uh, CBRE, uh, along with Marcus, uh, Marcus and Milchap, Colas, 
Coldwell Bankers, Commercial, all the big guys, and we go to them and we ask them for a pro forma. What is the market bearing in regards to returns as far as rentals, square footage, and all the cash flow on existing assets that are already cash producing that are like properties of what we're building. Then we take their numbers and we go, well, if the market is bearing this, we can rest assured that our numbers are going to be pretty damn close to that. So if we get to the end and we realize our values are not all there, we'll take some of this, this land value and we'll, we'll diminish it a little bit so that our cost basis is not so expensive. And now our, our pro, th this alone could help make our project pencil, especially in today's market. It wasn't a big deal two years ago because values were going through the roof, valuations were high, money was cheap, everything was plentiful. But in today's real world, this could be an issue if you're barely pushing the bar of stabilizing that asset, which is very true with most developments in today's current market. So land cost, we're going to assume about $5 million. Okay. Now, interest reserve. Let's figure this out really quick. We have, we know that our initial basis was $2.6 million. Let's say it takes us a full year to entitle the property. So if we have $2,600,000 was our original land cost, not the 5 million, the 2,600,000, but we also had some entitlement fees. Let's just call it $3 million. And most of our debt is between 8% and 12%. So let's call it 10% for a full year. That's $300,000. So we know that our, our interest reserve on this is going to be about 300,000. We need that to service the debt on the, on the uh, land. We also know that we're going to have $43,591,000 we need to be able to service the debt on, which is now the debt actually graduates with the loan. So what I always tell people is remember, you're not, they're not, the bank's not just going to stick $43 million in your bank account. It's be stupid. They want to know that that project is being built, and so they do monthly inspections and draw inspections. So anytime you're doing a draw, the bank goes in, and they rest themselves assured that there's a certain percentage of completion on your project, on every project. And so what ends up happening is they'll go in, and at the beginning, they might release $1 million to do a foundation or a plumbing rough in. Then the next draw might be $2 million. Then the next draw, another $2 million. Then the next draw, another million, $1.5 million. Then the next draw, maybe $3 million. So it's graduating. You're not servicing debt on this entire amount. Typically, you'll service debt on about 30% of this. But I always figure it at closer to 40. Let's take the entire amount of the loan, $43,591,000. And let's multiply that times a 9% interest rate right now, times 0 0.09. Say we do a Freddie Mac loan, it's 9% interest, it's actually a little lower than that, but 9% per year. Let's say it's an 18-month build. So now we take that number, which is $3,923,000. We multiply that times 1.5 times 1 1.5, because that's 18 months, okay? And that's $5,885,000 in debt service if we are paying that full amount over the course of time. Now look, we're only gonna pay about 30% of that, but let's just do it on 40. So times 0 0.40, that means you're going to have debt service of $2,353,914. So let's just call that debt service of $2,354,000. $2,2.354,000. We'll round up just a little bit. Okay, so our total debt service, our interest reserve, is going to be someplace in the neighborhood about $2,600,000. And where I got that was the debt service on the land and the debt service on the construction loan over the course of time. These two together is going to give me my interest reserve. Okay. Now we might have some placement fees and stuff. Those, those placement fees, let's call them 2%. We have some origination fees and some other um, expenses that we have to bear in here. So let's say that we have a placement fee of $43 million, 591 times point. One and a half percent. That's another six hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars in placement fees. So you have your total amount that you're going to need here. We're going to have five million dollars plus two million six hundred thousand plus six hundred and fifty thousand plus forty-three million five ninety-one total is fifty-one million eight hundred forty-one thousand. Okay. So fifty-one million. I, I just keep telling people a fifty-two million dollar build. Okay. So our entire cost. This is total cost equals $51,841,000, okay? Now, 
I'll do this in black because I know it's easier to read for you guys. We put it in black. Okay, so we have five, 51 million. Now, we know what our use is. We know where our money is. We have to come up with the percentages of this for the actual source. So our construction debt. Now, we know that our construction debt up here, this is going to come. We need to know what percentage is going to come from here, right? So we know that our construction money out of this 51%, they're, gonna, they're willing to give us 70% of it, okay? Because this is our whole cost basis in on our cost to build. These are all expenses. So when you say LTC, that's loan to cost, okay? That's loan to cost, cost to build. So this is the loan on the cost to build, okay? Now, it's not loan to value because there's no value there yet. It's not worth anything. There's no asset. So it's not loan to value because there is no value. So it's called loan to cost. So this is your cost. So total cost right here. They're going to give you, let's say the bank gives you 70% loan to cost. So we say our, con our construction debt is 70%. Okay. They want to know what that amount is. So we take the 51 million. We do times 0.70. And that's going to be 36, it's going to be 36 million, 288,700, okay? Now, we're actually getting 80% loan to cost right now with some of the loans that we're doing. We're doing a lot of private debt, private equity um, firms that are doing private debt. And we're also doing stuff like government assisted loans like HUD and uh, Freddie Mac loans that actually will, will produce 75 to 80% loan to cost still in today's market. So what we'll end up doing is we'll say um, if we get investors equity in here, um, let's say that we come in with 5%. So we have to show liquidity of 5%. If we're the, uh, the GPs, so we come in with 5% of our own money. So we take the same 51 million, 51, 841 times 0 0.05. That means we come in with uh, 20, uh, we come in with a total of 2 million, 500, let's call it 2.6. Well, let's, let's call the true numbers. Okay. So they're going to require us, we say 5%, they're going to require us to come to the bank with 2 million. Five hundred and ninety-two thousand, and this is pretty realistic of what we'd probably come in on our West Camelback project with our money out of pocket. Um, so Kyle and I'll probably come in with with something close to that. Now, investors' equity is going to be the variance. Now we don't have any NOI offset on this project, so we're just going to put zero percent in our uh, in our source to use because there is none. So that's going to be a big fat zero on that project. Um, and you just leave it like that. Mezzanine debt, we're not going to use mezzanine debt yet. We don't think we will. What mezzanine debt is, is let's say, for example, the bank's only willing to give you 60% loan to cost, and you only have the ability to get investor equity of 20%. The other 20% has to come from someplace. So it's called mezzanine debt. It's where a bank will come in and take second position to the first bank. A lot of times the lender, so if you use a broker, a commercial broker, there's a lot of them out there. They'll come in and they'll source the second for you. And so they'll go in and, and the bank that's taking the mezzanine debt on is typically comfortable with it. They're going to charge typically a higher interest rate. They'll sit in second position to the first bank, but they take the actual underwriting that the first bank does and they actually almost partner, sort of say, with the first bank to come in with the mezzanine debt. Now, the mezzanine debt usually comes in first. So we come in with, with, we come in with our money first. Then we come in with investors' equity money second, then mezzanine debt third, and then construction debts can always be the fourth. Okay, but in this instant, we're not using mezzanine debt. We're going to come in with construction debt third. We're, they're going to make us spend this money first, so we'll have no we'll have no uh, interest on on the money we spend of our own money. We will have investors' equity, so we'll keep that just in case we need it. And then, so we will have some debt on here unless they're coming in as equity ownership instead of uh, debt, um, debt partners where they come in and they just get paid out in debt. So a percentage like 8%, 10%, 12% annually, or we come in with equity. Okay. And if they come in with equity, then we don't pay them out with any debt. They're just into the project on the back end. They get paid just like we do. Now the construction debt is at 70%. So now let's go in 
and we have 25% of this that we have to raise. So the way we know what, the way we know what we're going to have to raise is we take the 51 million 841 and we take 25% of that. And it's this number plus this number minus this number and that should be 25% since this is 70 75 and out of 100, so we're going to take 25% that we're going to raise we know we have a $12 million, $12,960,000 that we're going to have to raise. Now, here's, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. We can take the basis of our land, okay? And I'll end with this. We can take the basis of our land. And since the land is already spoken for, we can subtract this number from this number right here. What we're getting from investors. And we can actually collateralize the value of that land, this $5 million, subtract it from $12 million. And so our investor equity, we can go out and raise $7.96 million instead of the $12 million. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're actually doing. So we'll end up going in and doing an eight to $9 million capital raise so that we overfund the account by a million dollars to make sure that if any of this doesn't fall in alignment, we have a little bit of a contingency budget to be able to focus on. So we'll go in and we're calling it a $9 million raise on our project because we'll take this and subtract it from our actually investor's equity because we'll collateralize this. Now, eye to eye with you as to what you're using the money for, where you're sourcing the money, and how this project is supposed to unfold, and what we're executing as far as management, both financially and use, to make sure that your project is successful from start to finish. Ladies and gentlemen, for more information just like this, make sure you guys click and subscribe to our YouTube channel, pound that thumbs up button, and I look forward to seeing you next time.